Good, good evening, every, is it working? Oh, there we go, excellent. Good evening, everyone. Oh, thank you, well, that was good, that was good. Welcome, we're so glad you're here. We hope you had a good dinner break. We know it's always a little bit of an adventure to head out into the streets of Washington, D.C. to find dinner, but hopefully you found something good. My name is Chris Kerr. I'm the executive director of the Ignatian Solidarity Network, and I'm honored to be able to welcome you all to this wonderful panel tonight entitled Faith, Discernment, and Democracy, Young People, and the 2024 Election. We are so excited to partner with Georgetown University's Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life. Um, we're really grateful to their team for being willing to enter into this partnership. Uh, many months in the making to create a really relevant conversation about the way that young people rooted in faith are engaged in the election. Um, it's pretty critical to be talking about this right now. We are you know, just a little more than a week away from the 2024 election. Not only do we have a significant presidential election, but we have important state and local races. And young people's votes matter uh, just as much as anybody else's. So to talk about this, to look at it through the lens of faith is invaluable. I want to, before we get started, I, I want to make sure that we recognize a couple sponsors who've helped to make our session this evening possible. We're going to share a couple brief videos. The first is going to be from the Catholic Theological Union. Here we go. Now we'll hear from the Alliance for Catholic, Catholic Education Teaching Fellows, which is often referred to as ACE. I also just want to brief, briefly share about, there we go, thank you, Andrew. Uh, briefly share about our uh, Ignatian Solidarity Network's election campaign that's been going on. We actually uh, launched the, the election campaign at another event with the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought uh, many months ago. It's called Voting is an Act of Love. The idea that when we go to vote and we head into the election booth, um, we don't just carry ourselves and our own needs with, uh, with us into the voting booth. We carry the needs of others. We carry their realities, their stories. Maybe the, some of the stories that we hear this weekend at the teach-in, we, we carry with us the needs of the earth and our ways that we have to care, uh, care for it. And, and so our, you know, our premise, our take, our, our angle is, is love. Right? We're concerned about others. We're concerned about the earth. So I'd encourage you to uh, sign our pledge to vote, uh, basically saying, I'm going to vote. Um, you know, some of you, maybe you're not young enough to vote in this election, but you can sign the pledge today to say, when I'm old enough to vote, I'm going to vote. Okay? And then you can also nominate friends to commit to voting uh, in this election or an upcoming election. And then the third thing is, you got to actually go vote then. You can't just say you're going to do it and then not do it, right? So um, I hope you'll sign the pledge tonight. 
And we'll leave that up there for a couple more seconds so you can get that. And while we're doing that, I'm, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited to have uh, Chris and Jack and Lauren and Kate with us. And to turn things over to Anna Gordon uh, with the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought at Georgetown to lead this panel. So Anna, Thanks, there you Chris. are. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I am so excited to be here uh, in the Georgetown room. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, for doing that for us. Uh, with everyone here at the Teach-In, it's great to be with all of you. Um, but also, we have, I think, over 500 people joining us online for the live wow. stream. So. Hello to everyone online as well. Um, as Chris said, my name is Anna Gordon, and I'm the program director of the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life at Georgetown University, where we seek to promote dialogue on Catholic social thought and national and global issues, build bridges across political, ideological, and religious lines, and encourage a new generation of Catholic lay leaders to see their faith as an asset in pursuing the common good. Tonight, we're talking about our nation's presidential election, which is now 10 days away. We know that people of faith play an important role in the US election outcomes, and that Catholics are one of the most important voting blocks. But the latest polling on Catholics in this election is conflicting. One poll from Pew Research Center recently showed that Catholic respondents overall were evenly divided between Harris and Trump uh, at 49% for each candidate. But another poll from Real Clear Opinion Research for EWTN showed that Catholics overall favored Harris at 50% over Trump at 43%. We're overwhelmed by this data, by the commentary on the news, by the endless stream of opinions and predictions that we see on our phones. So during the next hour, we're going to take a step back to hear from these four respected leaders to reflect on some key questions. What are the responsibilities of faithful citizens and voters, especially young adults? Does our faith compel us to vote for a particular candidate? What does it mean to have a well-formed conscience? And what issues, policies, values should guide our engagement in public life? We have four outstanding leaders to join us for this conversation tonight. Chris Crawford is a policy strategist at Protect Democracy, where he staffs the National Task Force on Election Crises and manages the Faith in Elections Playbook in collaboration with Interfaith America. Chris began his career at Susan B. Anthony List, the nation's largest pro-life political organization. Jack Jenkins is a national reporter with Religion News Service covering religion and politics. And Jack's also the author of American Prophets, the Religious Roots of Progressive Politics and the Ongoing Fight for the Soul of the Country. Lauren Relliford is the, pol uh, the policy director at the Children's Defense Fund and the former political director at Sojourners. Lauren's a graduate of Boston College. Woof, woof. Wow, that was, <laughs> I expected so much more from you guys. And yes, has, uh, we'll come back to that. Yes. Uh, and Lauren has an MSW from the Catholic University of America. And finally, Kate no, Scanlon no. is a national reporter for OSV News covering Washington. She's a former political reporter at the Washington Examiner and a former political affairs correspondent for EWTN. When we get to the Q&A period, we're gonna take questions from everyone here at the Teach-In. Uh, for those of us joining us on live stream, you can share your thoughts on social media using the hashtag IFTJ and hashtag Faith Discernment Democracy. Whether or not you're old enough to vote, we hope that this conversation will help you think about your values the principles of Catholic social teaching, and how to stay an informed and engaged in politics. So with that, let's get the conversation going. I'm gonna ask each of our panelists for a brief opening comment. I'm gonna start with Lauren, and we'll just come down the line here. What's the most important or surprising thing about the role of faith in the coming presidential election? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think, for me, it's actually the absence of faith in this election. I think the way that faith is not being centered as our reason why. Um, and I think that that's why a lot of folks feel so much despair, so much helplessness, so much anger, um, because there's just generally a lack of hope. And I think this is a really great time for us to question um, who we understand God to be, how, if we are made in his image, what does that mean to reflect his characteristics, and then how we take that into action. And so um, you'll frequently hear me say, oh my god, 2 plus 2 equals 4. And so a bit of the 2 plus 2 equals 4 that I have come up with is two scriptures, two pieces of theology, and my four. 
And the two scriptures are 1 Corinthians 12, 26, that reminds us that when one suffers, we all suffer. And so I'm thinking, OK, when I come to my vote, that means that I have to think about other people. Isaiah 43, 2 also says, we're going to go through some stuff, but we'll be OK. And so I'm like, OK, we're going to go through some stuff. And some of us are going to suffer, and it's going to cause us to suffer, but we're going to be OK. And then I think, how are we going to be OK? Well. AMDG, for the greater glory of God and for the salvation of all creation kind. So I have it literally tattooed on me. We remind ourselves that if we do for others, that hopelessness and that despair go away because we're bringing joy not just to some but to all. And then I also think about just basic Catholic social teaching, or I even think about the fact that the second book in the Bible is the Exodus. Genesis and Exodus, God creates, God liberates. That is how committed he is to us, and that is the characteristic. He wants us to be free. He wants us to enjoy things, right? And how do we do that? That's where my four comes in. The Book of James, I'm a huge fan. It's like, it just, it to me is, I don't know if the kids still say lit, but like it's super <laughs> lit. Um, and it's faith without works is dead. And so I'm looking and I'm thinking, what is God saying to me about the things that I want for others? And knowing that the ballot is faith in action, how am I then going into the ballot and thinking about what it means to cast a ballot that mitigates not just my suffering, but the suffering of others? Mm -hmm. That understands that we are in relation with others, and so we have to do things that center our understanding of God and what he wants us to create, not just for self, but for others, and then go into that ballot and do it. Thanks, Lauren. Jack, how about you? What's the most important or surprising thing about the role of faith? I'll go with surprising, and my viewpoint is um, that of a journalist, so it's kind of a 10,000-foot view of the kind of campaign, and I, try, I won't try to take all of them from you, um, but the one that has surprised me the most is religious groups always end up playing a significant role in terms of uh, being courted by various campaigns. Both Democrats and Republicans spend a lot of time courting different religious groups, particularly members of their base, and that's not new this year. We've seen a lot of that, and I'll talk more about it later. But what is interesting is this shift that's happening on the margins, where um, religious groups that have traditionally been you know, understood to be part and parcel of one party's base, there are slivers that are, some, uh, that are suddenly winnable for the other party. So the two most uh, dramatic examples are Muslim Americans in Michigan, um, where there's a significant population in Michigan, um, and Michigan goes by such a slim margin in the last few presidential elections that that is a block that can shift um, the state one way or another. Um, and traditionally, they've been very democratic in the way that they voted, but the Trump campaign has done a lot of work to try to win over just a few of those Muslim American voters, um, some of whom are disenchanted with the Biden administration, and just today, um, uh, Trump, who literally proposed a ban on Muslim immigration back in 2015, 2016, um, had imams on stage endorsing him today. Conversely, uh, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints um, are traditionally one of the, if not the most reliably Republican religious group in the country. They, they, they overwhelmingly have voted um, for Republicans right up until 2016, but there's some um, discord around Trump in particular in that group. And while they still majority vote Republican, um, they, Trump tends to lose way more of that group than other Republicans do. And it's gotten to the point where just this, um, this month, um, earlier this, or late last month, Harris unveiled a um, initiative specifically to target Mormon voters in Arizona because there are a significant percentage there who, for religious reasons, have trouble supporting Trump. And um, Trump then very quickly launched his own Latter-day Saints for Trump initiative. He's been campaigning for a year and a half. She's been campaigning for a few months. So it says a lot that they're trying to fight over this electorate. And that just wasn't true um, in the last election or the one before that. So we're seeing these shifting spaces in the um, religion and political landscape that we haven't seen in yeah. quite some time. Love to come back on that. Chris, what's the most surprising or important thing about the role of faith? Well, first, I just want to say I love being back at this teach-in. Um, I was formed in a lot of ways when I was working in youth ministry at my church, getting to volunteer here, but I felt like I was formed more than my students probably were. But this has been a meaningful space for me in my own discernment throughout my life. And so I'm praying that all of you have a similar experience um, over your time here. As far as something that surprises me, 
specifically my work is focused on ensuring free and fair elections and the peaceful transfer of power. And something that I've been thinking about is I think on January 6th, a lot was broken, but since January 6th, a lot has been built to respond. And I've been inspired by the work in, across faith traditions that I've been able to witness and be a part of that's not focused just on the political questions and just focused on candidates and issues, but on ensuring that our elections can run smoothly, that we can increase trust, and that we can get people involved in the process. And I've been able to see thousands of people sign up through faith-based efforts to be poll workers, for example, and people who are willing to talk to their neighbors who might not believe that our elections are trustworthy, and not just talk to them, but invite them to be a part of the process. And so that's been a beautiful thing that I think in many ways has gone under the radar, but it's this sort of dutiful work, community by community, and it's been an honor to be able to witness that. I hope that I never stop being surprised by the flip side of this, which is faith leaders who purport to have the same religious beliefs that I do, who are willing to lie about our elections and lie about our politics in order to seize power. That's something that I think should continue to upset us every time we hear it, even as we get better at responding to it and can continue to try to build this broad coalition of people of faith to respond to it. I think it's been interesting and surprising. Um, I want to make a similar point about a place where faith has maybe been absent mm -hmm. in this cycle, and that's um, honestly often in the messaging from the candidates themselves. Mm -hmm. I think in previous election cycles in the United States, we've seen the candidates make more overt appeals to their own personal faith mm -hmm. in engaging with these communities. And we haven't seen as much of that this cycle, and I do think that marks a really significant change in our, in our political mm -hmm. rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kate. Jack, I want to come back to you and pick up on what you were talking about. Um, to set the context for this discussion, both you and Kate are reporters here. How are the Harris and Trump campaigns reaching out and persuading voters for whom faith is an important part of their lives? This is a fascinating question. I literally spend all day, every day looking into it. Um, <laughs> the, you know, Harris, the, the thing to keep in mind when we're talking about the Harris campaign is that it is relatively unprecedented to have a presidential campaign this truncated, right? She, she you know, jumped into the race very late. She didn't have a long primary. So what that does is it means that she didn't spend the last year and a half mm -hmm. um, slowly building a coalition um, or targeting specific groups. So she's kind of doing everything all together at once um, as mm -hmm. a campaign. So you kind of have to like catch, you know, she did this one day and this another day. Um, but you know, Democrats actually traditionally have done a whole lot of faith outreach. Um, actually, in my book, which is right there, and I want to say that I did not bring that book. Chris <laughs> brought that book. I did not pay him. Um, uh, the, one of the largest faith outreach programs in modern presidential history was actually Barack Obama's mm. 2008 campaign. Um, mm -hmm. He robustly did a lot of faith outreach. And part of that is usually, um, for most Democrats, there's a lot of outreach to um, black Protestants in particular. And that's because they, they make up a huge um, subsection of the Democratic base. And we have definitely seen Harris um, in churches. And she's going to be at a church tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she's been, she, she leans on Galatians. Um, she uh, has also kind of you know, um, quoted scripture on the stump. And so that outreach has continued to happen. I am also aware that they have hired um, a faith outreach director a few weeks ago. Um, I got to break that story, which was somewhat interesting because they hired someone from kind of the um, liberal faith-based uh, activist community, which was is a, unusual. Usually there's someone kind of comes in from another world. Um, so that's interesting to me because that's someone who has plugged into a lot of these kind of liberal um, faith communities for quite some time. Um, I know that they have also, like as mentioned, done some outreach to Mormon voters in Arizona, um, Jewish voters in different parts of the country, particularly in Pennsylvania, and they are absolutely heavily courting Muslim voters in Michigan um, to try to you know, stem any losses that might be happening there. I should also note, sometimes faith outreach happens in unusual ways. So for instance, um, the black Protestants are one of the religious groups that are um, after Muslim Americans that are most um, uh, uh, energized by the issue of Gaza, and particularly upset with the Biden administration about it. Particularly black Protestant pastors have made that mm -hmm. very clear. And Harris has done um, some work with those pastors early on before she ran, before she was on the ticket of actually speaking to some of these pastors about it. Um, and there was a notable moment where when Netanyahu came and spoke to Congress 
earlier this year, she was not there. Um, she was instead at a sorority event, which was a significant political, um, power, politically powerful group in African American communities that actually overlaps with black church communities. And yeah. that's actually, it's been explained to me um, by several experts, that's actually also a form of faith outreach. It, yes. and, and it just looks different um, than people might think it does. Yes. So that's just the Harris campaign. The Trump campaign has actually been a bit interesting. Um, I do think, I agree that Trump doesn't necessarily speak from his own personal faith that often. Um, he, uh, although, although after the assassination attempt, he did start speaking about how he felt the hand of God. Um, and that has become a significant point of, of conversation among his evangelical supporters in particular. Um, and he identifies as a non-denominational non Christian. He used to identify as Presbyterian. He changed that at the tail end of his presidency. And that kind of speaks to his connection to evangelical voters. But while he has done um, some things over the course of this campaign to reach out to evangelical voters, he spoke at uh, the National Faith Broadcasters Association, I'm getting that name wrong, but something like that earlier this year. He has done a few prayer calls with some of these leaders. It, it's been less overt than he has in previous um, campaigns in terms of courting that vote. He did try to sell a Bible. Um, that he said make America pray again, but that was less a campaign thing and more a way for him to make money because he did, uh, that wasn't a paid endorsement. Um, and so it's been interesting, given everything I just said, that he spent the last week and a half aggressively targeting um, evangelical voters. He's done a series of event after event after event, um, speaking to evangelical voters, you know, talking about their importance. He's been telling them that they don't vote proportional to their um, section of society, saying they need to show up and vote. That is not true. They disproportionately vote outside of their, um, their subset of society, but it's, it speaks to how important he thinks this demographic is. Um, and he has, he has more faith events planned between now and election day, so I see that only um, to continue to ramp up. And I will note, uh, in addition to the Muslim American outreach I mentioned earlier, um, one thing that is kind of a sleeper element here is there is longstanding outreach by Republicans in general, and Trump in particular, to Hispanic evangelicals. Um, and they have been heavily courted by him when he launched his, um, uh, his Evangelicals for Trump initiative in the last campaign in 2020. He launched it at a Spanish-speaking church in Florida. He did a um, Latino Americans for Trump um, event this past week that was not touted as a faith event, but it ended with mm -hmm. a giant charismatic prayer with, with laying on of hands on mm -hmm. Trump. Yeah. And that is not surprising if you've been watching that element. So I think he's, he's hope, you know, he, that's part of a, uh, uh, an outreach effort he's done for some time, and he's really trying to capitalize on it this go round as well. So. Thanks. That was a very quick, good summary. Um, <laughs> just very briefly, can you tell us about the reporting you've done on the rise of Christian nationalism, and specifically a recent event where Republican vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance, who is a Catholic, he's the only um, Catholic on either major party ticket, um, his appearance at a town hall. Can you tell us what Christian nationalism is and its impact on the election? And tell us a little bit more about that story you did on Vance. Just very briefly. Yeah, um, so Christian nationalism has, is a, uh, one of those things that people fight over the definition of it. My working definition is that it's the belief that America was founded as a Christian nation and that it's either departed from that and needs to come back um, to it or that its Christian identity needs to be protected. Interestingly, the second half of that sentence is becoming way more important than the first. There's a whole wing of Christian nationalism that actually thinks like the founders screwed it up by not founding it explicitly as a Christian nation and we just need to fix that now. Um, but, the, but it's this idea of, of America wanting to be a Christian nation. Admittedly, there are actually a spectrum of beliefs as to what that would mean when we're talking about people politically activated by it. It usually is disproportionately conservative Christians. It usually is um, centered around a specific series of beliefs regarding abortion and same-sex marriage and um, uh, LGBTQ issues and, and uh, rights um, campaigns as well as some, uh, in some circles, uh, explicit white supremacy and white nationalism. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's a guy named Nick Fuentes who was very present, on, um, his folks were very present around January 6th who identifies as a Christian nationalist and also as a white nationalist. And I bring that up, um, he's Catholic, by the way, um, and he, he also says he wants to have Catholic Taliban rule. That's his phrase, not mine. Um, but I bring him up because that has been an aspect of Trumpism mm. um, that has been explicitly Christian nationalist, that's been explicitly extremist as well. But the, it, the breadth of impact of this group is actually much larger than just those folks who use overt extremist language. 
And Trump has long benefited from it. It has been a part of his rise to power since the beginning, despite he himself um, having a complicated relationship with faith. Um, and uh, I will point out that J.D. Vance, who is Catholic, and I, I, I missed earlier, there is also aggressive outreach to Catholics. It's specifically to conservative Catholics, and J.D. Vance himself is a convert to Catholicism. Um, he had a Catholics for Trump event in the Rust Belt just the, the weekend before last. Um, and he is an interesting figure because he has also attached himself um, and been associated with some figures who are uh, prominent in what's called Catholic integralism, which is not technically Christian nationalism, but it is the belief that perhaps the state should have more overtly religious and Christian elements to it, specifically Catholic elements to it. He spoke at a conference in Ohio while he was running for Senate that was kind of led by Catholic integralists. Some of the, the, the thinkers that he really admires are Catholic integralists. And when I was at that event, um, it was actually an unusual pairing because that event that I went to in Pennsylvania was actually led by a Protestant over a self-identified Christian nationalist by the name of Lance Wallnau. Um, he compares Trump to Cyrus, the biblical Cyrus, kind of this figure that may not be fit all, um, be a, a traditional Christian figure, but they do Christian things, as it were. And, um, and so this was an explicitly Christian nationalist event that J.D. Vance showed up at. He pretended it wasn't. He got on stage and said, this is about addiction and recovery, even though everyone before he had gotten on stage was talking about Christian nationalism. And then when he had the event, um, he gave an interesting argument about um, immigration, where he argued that Christian teaching teaches you to take care of your family first, and thus, by the transitive property, I guess, the government should take care of its own citizens first, um, and which isn't necessarily in line, I've been told by many scholars, by um, many understandings of Catholic teaching. Um, I have not had any bishops respond to my inquiries about what they think about that, um, uh, and I've asked a lot of them. Um, but but it, it is interesting that he, I heard that theology from people in the room before he got on stage. So um, there's some overlap between the Catholic elements here and the Protestant elements. Mm. So. Thanks, Jack. Kate, you're a DC-based reporter for OSB News, which is a national and international wire uh, service reporting on Catholic issues and issues that affect Catholics. So what's the latest information on how Catholics specifically will vote in November based on race, gender, geography, other factors? Absolutely. Well, as you mentioned in, in your open polling on this is very conflicted. Yeah. And Catholic voters tend to be more evenly divided than some other Christian denominations mm -hmm. when it comes to general elections, um, they will very often in recent decades kind of switch back and forth between candidates and parties. Um, we are seeing some similar trends with Catholic voters that we are seeing to the general electorate. So for example, um, well, there's some polling suggesting that Catholics overall are more supportive of Trump. There's some other polling that contradicts that. Hmm. Um, there are other indications that white Catholics tend to be more supportive of Donald Trump, while Hispanic and black Catholics tend to be more supportive of Kamala Harris. We are also seeing a very similar gender gap in mm -hmm. Catholic voters that we're seeing to the general electorate with women more likely to support Vice President Harris and men more likely to support Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. um, so these are, these are some of the trends that we're seeing. And also another aspect of this is that Catholic voters um, are gonna play likely a very huge role in determining some of these Rust Belt swing state contests. Um, Exit polling from the 2020 election showed that 30% um, of respondents in those polls identified themselves as Catholic in Pennsylvania. Mm. And Pennsylvania is like the key swing state, obviously, as we all know, right. um, this cycle, or we believe it will be. Um, so these, these are very similar trends that we're seeing to, yeah. to the general public in many cases. So in this election, Democrats have focused their campaign on support for unrestricted access to abortion, and they seem to be de-emphasizing support for humane immigration policies, while Republicans are abandoning uh, or are silent on past pro-life positions on abortion and are centering their campaign on opposition to immigration. So what does that mean for Catholic voters uh, in the election, and how have they responded? This is a tension that Pope Francis touched on recently when he was asked about the American election, and he basically cast it as a matter of choosing between two evils, and he cited those particular policy areas of abortion and immigration. Um, and I think this is part of why Catholic voters are often so easily divided, so closely divided, is because these are very tough questions mm -hmm. to wrestle with in many cases. And um, very often Catholic voters will follow a couple different categories of 
patterns. They are Republicans or they're Democrats, and they're going to vote the way their fellow partisans mm. vote. Um, some cases, you have Catholic voters navigate these issues by choosing one issue or an issue area that they feel most strongly about, and they'll tend to support the candidate that agrees with them in that area. Mm. Sometimes you'll have voters who look at it in terms of a checklist, and they'll say, you know, oh, well, this candidate agrees with me about seven things, and this candidate agrees with me about three things, so I'm going to support the one that agrees with me about more. Mm -hmm. But then you will have a smaller group of Catholic voters who will say, I can't support either of these candidates in mm -hmm. good conscience. And these voters will sometimes, for example, they might choose to support the American Solidarity Party, for example, is one that has come up in conversations. Um, and so these are, these are really tough questions that, that Catholic voters are wrestling with. Yeah, thanks for that, Kate. Chris, can you tell us a little bit more? You mentioned when you first spoke uh, that you work with faith communities. So tell us about those faith communities that are working to safeguard our democratic norms and institutions. What are concrete steps that these communities are taking to build trust in the election process um, and support these institutions? Sure. I love talking about this, so thank you for the question. <laughs> um, so I actually work at an organization that does not have a faith-based tradition. It doesn't have a sort of theological stand, but we're focused on opposing authoritarianism and ensuring that our democracy and its institutions can endure. And we are engaging with faith communities because we think that in order to protect against authoritarianism and preserve our democracy, you have to be able to build a broad coalition of people who might have big disagreements on politics or policy areas, but who are willing to prioritize the defense of our democracy. And we have never been able to build that coalition in this country without faith communities at the lead. And I don't think we can build that coalition right now without the leadership of faith communities. The project that we're specifically doing is working with an organization called Interfaith America. And we've created what's called the Faith and Elections Playbook. Lowe was on the um, advisory committee for drafting this playbook. The thing that I like about it is that very few of the ideas in it come from me. It basically was looking around the country and saying, what are some of the things that are happening that we could just put in one place, give guides on how to do it, also tell people, if our language for this doesn't work for you, change it. If our logo doesn't work for you, plagiarize us. And so it's been really nice to be able to meet people where they are in their communities because it's designed so that a wide variety of faith communities can engage in a way that aligns with their values and their skill sets and the needs of their community. And so a few of the different areas, one is recruiting poll workers. Our elections are run at the local level around the country. We need about a million poll workers. Mm -hmm. And so faith communities play such an important role in the local civic fabric of all of our different states and counties. So we've engaged people in doing that. There are also poll chaplains or peacekeepers that different organizations train, Faiths United to Save Democracies, um, sort of the marquee organization working on that. Mm -hmm. These are people that just are at the polling locations making sure things are running smoothly. They're also trained in de-escalation. So if violence mm -hmm. or threats or just intensity happens, they're on the front line um, trying to help a peaceful voting process. There's also a big focus on just bridge building conversations. Our communities are so divided and faith organizations can play a role in interfaith conversations or as a lot of us know as Catholics, our individual parishes are really divided as well. Mm -hmm. So faith leaders can help hold us together. And then there's also these interactions between election officials and the public. Most people don't know how our elections run. I think mm -hmm. an issue that we have in our understanding and the challenges that we have with our election right now is not that too many people are asking questions about our elections, it's that they're not looking for the answers when they ask questions about how our elections mm -hmm. are working. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to build these relationships between faith leaders and the local election officials so they can have conversations to get good information out. Mm. Um, one example that I really enjoyed recently was in my own county, uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, I took a few faith leaders to go watch the testing of the election equipment. And I work on elections every day, and I was shocked at how little I knew about all the details that go into securing every step of the process, all mm. the backups that are in place, that I wish that more people would just go see that. And election officials are frustrated because they get so many angry phone calls, they get so many threats, and then when they say, everyone come watch how this works so you understand it, no one shows up. Mm -hmm. And so we're really trying to engage faith leaders as community mm -hmm. leaders and also as moral leaders. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just been 
an incredible project to be a part of. Because again, it's not like we're out in front leading. We're trying to resource people who are already doing the great work. Oh, that's good news. Um, you are a Catholic. You understand how important it is to vote um, as Catholics. And I think a lot of people in this room, because they're here and people online believe that as well and participate in our democracy. So how are we meant to form our consciences as Catholic voters? Uh, what are the responsibilities of young Catholics in particular and people of faith more broadly who are gonna vote in this election? It's a big question. Um, <laughs> first, a disclaimer. I just mentioned my organization is not a faith-based organization. Yes. What I'm about to say is my own reflection <laughs> as a lay Catholic. Do not hold any affiliation I have accountable. Um, I would, Except her. I'd like to focus on truth and love. Mm. The first is truth. I dream of the day when in our politics someone thinks, oh, that person is a Christian. They must be telling the truth. Mm. I think we're really far away from that when we look at our mm -hmm. politicians right now. Mm. And it's something that each of us has a stake in. And it's a small way that we can add more to our politics is by committing to telling the truth, especially hard truths to our own political tribes. And then a few reflections on love. In the United States, we have the Eucharistic revival going on right now. And so one thing that I've been thinking about are, is Pope Benedict's framing in Deus Caritas Est. He talks about the Eucharist. And he talks about how the Eucharist is an act of love that we encounter and in turn are called to take out into the world and bring love to our neighbors. And that if the Eucharist does not transform us in that way, that's not good. Pope Benedict said it a little more clearly than I did. But <laughs> the Eucharist should transform us. And I would encourage people to make sure you're going to Mass over the next few weeks. Go to confession over the next few weeks. Go through an examination of conscience. And really think about how you're called to be active in our election at this moment. A couple other notes on love. I love the theme of the pledge that we just saw because voting is a way of loving our neighbors. And I've been thinking a lot, and some of us were talking about this just in this hall before, there's not enough of a real deep focus on Catholic social teaching among Catholic voters. And the data that you were just referencing sort of shows this. I'm especially thinking about the preferential option for the poor in Catholic social thought. Each of us will have different ideas for how we can best serve the most vulnerable human beings in our society. We'll all have different policy solutions. But if every Catholic committed to at least having that priority, if we could transform our hearts in that way, we would transform the Republican Catholics, would transform the Republican Party. The Democratic Catholics would transform the Democratic Party. Those of us not in either party, could help to change the entire political landscape just by prioritizing the things that Jesus tells mm -hmm. us to prioritize so clearly. Mm -hmm. One last thing about something Jesus said. One of the hardest things, the reason I bring this up is it's really hard for me, so I don't want this to come off as lecturing anybody. We're also called not just to love our neighbor, but love our enemy. Mm. And I don't think any of us should think of our political opponents as our enemies. But I think we should all think over the next few weeks, what does it look like to love the people in my life who are not going to vote like I do? Mm. What will it look like in the next few weeks to love candidates that I would never vote for and that I find dangerous and that I will spend every ounce of energy to defeat? What does Christian love look to those candidates? And I think that we can make a big difference in our country if we focus on the things that Jesus calls us to focus on. And if we can't reach that bar of loving our neighbors and loving our enemies, we're not reaching the very clear standard that Jesus set for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lauren. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Chris gets a clap, wow. I know. All right. All right. Thank you, Chris. Nothing uh, for Boston College, but something for Chris Crawford. OK, I see how it is. Maybe we, can we give a shout out to Boston College? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good job. We, we do that. Um, Lauren, you work at Children's Defense Fund, uh, which promotes policies that protect children and families living in precarious economic situations. How should these issues, uh, in particular, factor into our discernment around the candidates we vote for and the causes we support? Yeah, sure. So I think 
Um, and always so appreciative of Chris. I think he and I, part of the friendship that we've developed through work is because we genuinely have the same values. Mm. Um, regardless of where we've worked, where we came from, what we believe in, how we may have voted, um, I genuinely appreciate Chris because of his humanity and the things that he does for humanity. And I think when we, and I love the fact that you brought up Catholic social teaching because in the Bible in general, there is a preferential option for the vulnerable. And constantly, God is showing up for the vulnerable in so many different ways. If you look at the stories of the saints, they become saints because they have done something for the vulnerable in their communities, right? And a lot of them represent vulnerabilities in us that we go to God to pray for. Saint Teresa of Lisieux, right? She's the patron saint of depression. And when you feel that way, you pray to her, right? Um, and so I think when you think about those that are most vulnerable, children. Like you said, some of you guys aren't eligible to vote yet. And I actually remember that because my mom would drag me to the voting booth every election. And when I say every election, I'm talking state, local, uh, I'm talking <laughs> off cycle, in cycle. Um, but I understood that she was voting for me. I understood that she was voting because she wanted to make sure that I had the things that would allow me to be the little Lauren that the big Lauren is now. Mm -hmm. And so I always understood that it was never about me, it was about someone else, and it was always an investment in the future. We currently are experiencing things that are the results of presidential administrations in the 1980s. A president is not just a president for four years. They are president for generations. And so when you go in there, again, we have to center our faith and center our faith on the people that God calls us to go to in their distress, in their brokenness. And so again, when it comes to children and families, I think about the things that they need. I think about how I hope that parents don't just have to focus on the responsibilities of parenthood, they can actually appreciate the joys of it watching their kids grow up, watching their kids enjoy things instead of focusing on how much I have to pay for this, that, or the other. And I hope that kids have the things that I did or did not have, right? Because I think a lot of us forget that Christians, a lot of us are Christians because we've been hurt and we want to mitigate that hurt. We're not hurt people that hurt people, right? And so I go in and make sure that folks have the things that they need, whether that's free meals, whether that's quality education, whether that's making sure that families have working wages to ensure that they can then, again, take care of their kids. My vote isn't just about myself. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about myself because I am a Christian, because I am a Catholic, a cradle Catholic at that. And I have always understood my Catholicism to be, again, more about me. It's always been about something or someone else. Mm -hmm. And so when the work that I do at Children's Defense Fund, again, is empowering those children empowering their voices, actually listening to their voices, and then going into the booth with their stories. Mm -hmm. And thinking, how can I do something that is going to actualize a better future that maybe I can't even see? But again, Hebrews 11 tells us faith is being certain of the things that we're unseen and hope of things that we want, mm. right? And so it's just, again, how are we living out our faith? Who are we living it for? And I think it's really clear that we should be living it for each other. And your vote should really reflect that. But that takes reflecting of what those things mean to you. I want to um, tell everyone here in person, we are going to do Q&A in just like 90 seconds. So if you have a question, <laughs> we have a microphone set up in the back. So please make your way to the microphone. We do have limited time. So if we don't get to all of your questions um, after we f formally end here, we would be happy to stay and talk after, but um, please do start lining up. Lauren, we're just days away from this pivotal election. <laughs> we're, we're, we all know that. So what? get a little more concrete. What are the issues, policies, values, principles that should guide our engagement in political life as young adults who are committed to the principles of Catholic social teaching? Sure. So I think the best way to think about this, and I'll give sort of a formula for folks, um, is think about an issue that you care about and understand 
how it's impacted folks. And don't just necessarily go on the internet, actually ask people that have gone through it. There's nothing more than I hate when I go into a meeting with a member of Congress or their staff or someone and they have so much to talk about SNAP, but they've never been on it and I have before. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you gonna tell me about this program? And thank you for assuming that me and my mom and my family were welfare queens and we were just freeloaders. Freeloaded me here, so, you know, <laughs> right? So think about that from that perspective. And then think about the future that you want. What future do you want? We want, again, public education that's quality wherever you go. You should have a meal at school and you shouldn't be penalized if your parents can't afford it. Because why are you punishing a child for their parents? Yikes. We should make sure that whether you go to college or not, you have a workforce to come into. And as someone who graduated into the 07 recession, I am especially bitter <laughs> about that and especially <laughs> passionate about that. Trust oh. me, guys, <laughs> right? We should think about, again, a future. When we say on earth as it is in heaven, what does that mean to us? What does on earth as it is in heaven mean to us? And do we actually believe that God intends for us to prosper here on this earth, again, as it is in heaven? And if we do, what does prosperous look like? What does abundance look like for all? Mm. It doesn't mean trying to figure out if I'm going to seek help for my parents or quit my job because I have to take care of them. No, you should be able to care for your parents and still have a life. It doesn't mean I have to work all these hours while I'm at school to help, pay, to help my family pay for their bills. That's not what God intends for us. And so I think I'm giving just really high level because I really want something applicable for you guys. Think really about what does God want for us and who is God? Hmm. Who is God? Who is he to me and what would he do? Yeah. And that is what matters. And if you believe in a God of love, what does love mean to you? And how do you love people? And how do you love people through a ballot? And who is saying the things that reflect love? And do they match what you believe, or are you matching your beliefs to fit someone else? Do you have your own identity rooted in your own values and your own understanding of these concepts, or are you being shaped by what other folks are telling you? Yeah. Hmm. So I think that those are just some things that, like, we can talk about the issues, but I really want folks to just, like Chris said, do some basic examination. Yeah. And as a youth, this is actually prime time because identity formation is a major developmental mile task. task. That's the social worker in me coming out. Yeah. So this is prime time for you to ask yourself those questions. Thanks, Lauren. I see people are lined up. Um, mm -hmm. If I could just ask you to say your name, what school or organization you're with, and just put your question in the form of a question. <laughs> That's my, my colleague, John Hart. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Finn Connolly. I'm from St. Xavier High School in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, first, thank you guys for taking time out of your weekends to be here and talk to us. Uh, my question is, based on all of what you've said about how important like faith communities are in the elections and how we decide who our leaders are going to be, do you think in the uh, not-too-distant future there could ever be an atheist or agnostic president? Ooh. I wonder if one of our reporters, Jack, I see potential for that. Um, I think, especially as the general public becomes a little less religious, I don't know that voters would hold it against a candidate now the way they may have in the past. But that's certainly a very interesting question, and that's a question we might see out, mm. see play out in the coming decades. And I will only add to that to say, um, if you ask a few years ago, um, in terms of how, in polling, what people were least likely to vote for, atheists was below um, Muslim Americans, it was below, like, it was the least liked candidate was atheist. Mm. Simultaneously, over the last few years, there's been several mem members of Congress who formed the Free Thought Caucus, um, one or two of which have openly identified as atheist and agnostic. So that wall has been broken in some regard. Um, my expectation would be that people would have to win a few elections for that to get one way or another. That's usually how it happens. but. Stranger things have happened in, in American politics. So. Great question. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, my name is Bob Kane. I'm from uh, Marquette High in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, my question is, uh, during the election, as Catholics, how should we 
balance the factors of the uh, candidate's character and the candidate's policies? Mm. Mm, that's a great question. Lauren? Um, so to me, they should be aligned, right? Like if you are of good character, the definition of being you center others, then your policy should also center others. Um, and so I think that this is where you add in, what are my values? Do my values and my character match this candidate? And based on what I think it should be, is this really where they're going? I think just to add to what the question before, um, and I think you'll also find we probably have already had a lot of agnostic or atheist candidates. They're just using our faith to cover for their, their desire for power, right? Because fundamentalists use religion for power. And so I think that, again, it's a true examination of yourself and your character, and then trying to see if those candidates match that. Because oftentimes you'll see two plus two does not equal four in that situation. And that's why I always love to say it. Thank you. Anything to add? Sure. Um, I think leadership is, there's a line from the movie The American President, which isn't a very good movie, but there's a good line <laughs> that where he says the presidency is entirely about character. Mm -hmm. And I think that line is pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's true. I think that leadership is a lot about character and what you can accomplish has a lot to do with your character because your character also sets your priorities. And so in addition to the long list of issues that a candidate might have opinions on, there's also the question of what's going to be at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. What are they willing to sacrifice on that list for something else on that list? And so that for someone who works on democracy issues, I might agree with a candidate on some major philosophical and political issues if they're willing to tear the system down because their character drives them toward power, mm -hmm. I won't vote for that person. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's hard to overstate how important character is. Um, mm -hmm to leadership and especially the presidency. Great. Hi, uh, my name is Eli Hansen. I'm from Portland, Oregon at uh, Jesuit High School. And I know a lot of Catholics who just simply aren't voting this year. And this is something that uh, they haven't done in past uh, election years. Uh, what would you say to them? So as a black Catholic, it's very frustrating to hear because I have family, I have people that I was, I was related to that literally died to try to get their vote. And so um, I think given the fact that a vote is actually a great tool of faith to express your faith and to express who you think God is, um, sitting out really isn't an option because again, your vote matters for other people. Even if you're voting for your own senator, that senator then goes into a body with 99 other people and has decisions over 330 million people and so again, I understand you wanting to protest a vote, but you're doing more harm than good. And I think just really, again, think about what your vote can bring about, not what it can destroy, because the Bible tells us that anything that seeks to cause division is of devil, is of Satan, right? So use this opportunity knowing, and I'm not trying to be like dramatic, but this really is going to change us as a society, as a culture, and ways in which we have been seeing, certainly since 2000, but this is kind of the pimple has gotten a little too big and it's gonna burst. <laughs> and so, uh, this is very gross, but for those visual learners, hopefully that makes sense, right? And so, like, this is a pimple that they can't ignore, and so Let's while I certainly me. understand sitting out, like, this is the time to actually do something with your faith and make a statement with your faith. Um, and I think it's too important. Um, and certainly, my folks have died to be able to do this. So if it wasn't that much of a big deal, people wouldn't, pe people wouldn't have died to try to get this right, right? Um, and people wouldn't try so hard to take it away if it wasn't important. So never, pearls before swine, right? Don't be that swine. Thanks. Could I just yeah. add to that briefly? Um, I would also encourage you to remind them that just the only thing I would add to that would be that um, we do have a system that allows, you don't necessarily have to select somebody who's actually on the ballot mm -hmm. if you are that discouraged. Um, I have talked to voters who do have conscientious mm -hmm. objections on both sides, and that, that matters sometimes. Um, but you know, write-in options are a possibility, and those down-ballot 
yes. races are it's just as important to participate exactly. in our democracy that way. Great. Yeah, local <laughs> elections, I've spent a lot of time reporting on them. They definitely impact your life. So if you can write in a cartoon character for president and the local um, school board official would still very much like you to show up and vote. Yeah. <laughs> so. Great question. Well, thank, thank you. I'll make you. sure to tell them about the pimple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, your <laughs> pimple cream is amazing. Good evening, my name is Diego. I am from Creighton Preparatory School in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, as a Gen Z Catholic, issues like abortion have risen to the top of the ticket issue um, during this election. How do you think Gen Z voters with issues like abortion will change the outcome of the 2024 election? And what do you think that says about the future of the Catholic identity and tradition as Gen Z um, Catholics enter um, an older age? Uh, I mean, the question of how abortion will impact this uh, election is the one that actually sits over all of it. Like for a lot of our of, uh, us in reporting, you know, Harris just did that event uh, yesterday, yesterday with Beyonce, um, and uh, she quoted scripture at the end. And I mean, one of the things that is, is interesting, um, I'm, I'm sure everyone here knows, when you poll Catholics nationwide, the majority of Catholics believe that abortion should be legal in all or most cases. And that's been true for some time. Um, and the, it is also true that um, we just, uh, my colleagues and I at NPR just reported this out a little bit ago, um, the Catholic bishops spent a lot of money on abortion referendums um, a couple of years ago, and they are not this go round, despite the fact that it is on the ballot in 10 states. And uh, there's a myriad of reasons why that might be the case. One of the theories is that they assume that despite the fact um, that uh, the, um, what the church teaches and the fact that the bishops themselves advocate for that position, um, the folks in the pews just don't agree. And, uh, and like a lot of their outreach efforts that they are making this year are actually directed to Catholics, um, not trying to convince people outside of the tradition. So uh, generally speaking, Gen Z and anyone younger than 35 holds a different position on abortion than people who are older than them. Um, so the expectation is if, you know, if past is prologue, if the way things went in Kansas and Ohio and um, Kentucky um, repeat this go, long, this go round, that would be very good for Harris and that would be, say a, a resounding message about abortion moving forward. There's also an argument um, that those same voters aren't necessarily single issue voters in the way that their parents or their grandparents were. And so while they might hold a different position than their parents, that is not the only issue that matters to them, which is a messy, not clear answer to your question. Um, but I don't know if anyone else has an answer to that. I, I think it also depends how many Gen Z voters choose to vote. Um, it, that's, you know, as you guys come of age, it'll be really interesting to see the levels of participation in in elections like this. So we are gathering data on that. That's part of the reason for the unclear answer is because we are still learning that. Okay. I would just add quickly, I think it's a unique opportunity, and this I'm saying completely unaffiliated from work. So, <laughs> <laughs> caveat, um, caveat. Yeah. Um, I think it's a really unique opportunity for younger voters to define, redefine what it means to be pro-life in this election. Um, and I'm not quoting a very liberal pope when I say this, but Pope John Paul II in the 70s said that life from conception through all subsequent stages is sacred. And so I think, again, when you think about your vote, um, you can think about how your pro-life course and what it means not just to vote for you, but what it means to create a stable system as you become an aging and older adult. As a social worker has worked with aging and older adults, 65 and older, care is abysmal. And so again, it's how are we thinking about intending to life and all the ways in which it shows up and all the ages and stages it shows up. And I think that's why I do so much with children and families. It's because, okay, we're here. What are the systems of care that are gonna support you now that you're here? And so I think maybe um, that is an interesting way to start discussions with people um, and say, what is life? How do you understand it? And what do you understand it needs to thrive rooted in your faith? That's great. Chris? She actually ended up covering most okay, of it. Okay, great. <laughs> I, know, I, know. I never could have dreamed, so. Well, and I know we are up at time, and you, everyone here at the teaching in the room has a very busy schedule. Um, so I, I'm so sorry we're not going to get to the other questions. But I do want to just wrap up our, our conversation here by just going down the line. I'll um, start with Laura and, and just go down and ask you all, 
for one action step, one concrete thing in a word or a sentence. I'll challenge you to do it in a word or a sentence that we can take in the next 10 days um, ahead of the election. I'll start with you, Lauren. Um, interrogate yourself. Right. Interrogate your values. Um, study your ballot. And go vote. <laughs> Wonderful. Jack? I'm going to use a couple hyphens and semicolons. Um, the, I spend a lot of, we, have a, we live in a participatory democracy. Mm. And I spend a lot of my time talking about very small groups that have disproportionate power in our democracy. It's about who shows up. And if you think you don't have power, I absolutely assure mm -hmm. you, you do. Mm -hmm. And that is who ends up running the game. So if you don't like the way things are, or you do like things are and want them to remain the same, you have wild power, not only in your vote, but also in activism to impact that. Great. Chris? One of my favorite lines I heard in a talk recently was from Sister Bethany Madonna of Sisters of Life. And she said to her audience, there was a moment when God said, not another day without you. Mm. And that's true for every person in this room individually. And God chose this moment to have you on this earth, in this country. Mm -hmm. And so be the person who God is calling you to be. Mm -hmm. Be heroic about it in these next few weeks. Don't be the person Kamala Harris wants you to be, or Donald Trump wants you to be, or anyone else. Be the person who God wants you mm -hmm. to be in these next few weeks and beyond. Um, I would say seek truth. Mm -hmm. um, especially those of you who are too young to vote this mm -hmm. particular election, I really want to encourage you to foster your media literacy skills mm -hmm. as you prepare moving forward. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a really, really vital aspect of, um, of a well-formed conscience, especially for, for us who are Catholic um, as we move forward. Great. Um, thank you all for this rich discussion. <laughs> Briefly, for those of you who don't know about our initiative, I'd encourage you to come up front and we have some information. We do have an, a dialogue coming up one week after the election online on November 12th. We're going we're to talk about, hopefully we know the results of the election by then, um, but we're going to have uh, pollster Ryan Burge, Father Tom Reese, Sabrina Rodriguez, and Judy Woodruff oh, on that great conversation. Panel. Wow. That's a great panel. So visit our website. <laughs> Um, this conversation has been recorded and posted, uh, and so check that out after the fact, and thank you all for being here.